This is the Lydian Spin with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. We're in... Where the hell are... Where the hell does Robert... Uh, we, we, no, no, I'm not even going to tell you where he lives. Well, the outskirts of Los Angeles. Okay, We're in the outskirts of Los Angeles talking to one of my favorite thinkers, artists, philosophers, Robert Williams, uh, the lowbrow artist who started the magazine Juxtapose, who uh, came up doing the art for Big Daddy Ed Roth. That would be like Rat Fink. The people from my generation remember from wearing T-shirts and had models of Rat Fink. And basically, he's an all-around badass, brilliant hot rodder, goes to hot rod shows. He's got I don't even know how many cars in his garage, and he's painted I don't know how many incredible paintings, which he uses... I wouldn't say a one hairbrush like Joe Coleman, but certainly he uses almost a binocular to paint them. And most of his paintings are about the domination of women's superior sexuality, which has been misinterpreted by feminists for decades as actually being misogynist. I think he's one of the most pro-female artists um, and also not only pro-female, but like an incredible craftsman artist. Punk rock kind of gave him a push because when the punk rock, L.A. punk rock and say the late 70s, early 80s, when he was just coming up out of the uh, Rat Fink and out of Zap Comics, which he also was doing, and Robert Crumb and various other incredible cartoonists in the late 60s, punk rock clubs would often have art shows in which he would, and he loved the atmosphere of punk rock because it was violent, it was sexy, it was dirty, and it did not judge sexuality in the wrong way. He kind of understood what he was doing. Well, he's clearly a man of his own design and he's moral about his own design because he's dedicated to it in the most moral fashion ever, even based on his own criticism of himself. He's a very dedicated human being. Pre-punk rock, the psychedelic movement, but he was always outside of all those things. He just happened to be actually in the zeitgeist of the outside. And it actually worked consistently throughout the, his whole life, and it still works and because he's true to himself. And what's incredible about Robert Williams is the paintings are not only incredibly detailed and just so psychedelic, but the writing that accompanies them is just absolutely magnificent. I mean, he's such an such a intellectually psychedelic human being. But what's so interesting about this interview, more than anything, is Lydia Lunch and Robert's chemistry. He likes those old fashioned kind of female bodies. Oh, he you know? does. Oh, yeah. He does. And, 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 and he's you, always wanted to pay me. And I said, hey, you sell your paintings for $60,000, you ain't going to pay me. And unlike young boys that jerked off too much to free internet porn, he still has an imagination for sexuality and the real and, thing. And, and the real thing. This is the Lydian's Man with Lydia Lunch and Tim Dahl. And this is one of my favorite thinkers, artists, and basically. He might be a little bit, yeah, well, whatever his age is, I don't even know, but I just love Robert Williams. And if you don't know who he is, hey, we do love each other. If you don't know who he is, just look him up, buy his books. I did write the intro for one of his books. That wasn't even enough. I had to defend him against the ridiculous feminist backlash against people that did not fucking understand that he's actually the biggest lover of women and respects their intelligence and power. That's what all of his paintings are about. Women are dominating every single frame of all of his paintings. Hot, hot rods, psych- hot women, hot rods, hot women, psychedelia, intellectual, I- intellectuality, anti-intellectuality. It's all there. Badass uh, to the highest degree. Besides that, he's trying to hook me up with this like hot rodder that he knows. I mean, I said I was the hot rod of women. What can I say? Robert Williams, here we go. <laughs> Excuse me, this is the Lydian Spin with Tim Dahl, and today we are featuring one of my favorite people on the planet. One of my favorite writers, actually. He might not be known as much for his writing as for his paintings, but if you buy the book, you'll be able to read what he actually has to say, which is very important. That's Robert Williams. Hello, Robert. <laughs> well, th- thank you, lady. I appreciate this uh, very, very much. And we've got we've got a lot to talk about, and if you're going to talk about me, I'm... Uh, I'm caught between uh, having a lot to say about me and a lot to hide. So I, I, I well, Robert, know. you know I gotta confess something. I love everything about you, including your wife. Yeah. <clears throat> Suzanne Williams, a great artist in her own. Well, I, 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 I've developed an appreciation for her too. 
<clears throat> how long? Oh, yes. okay. It's an unusual because you've been married how long? Does he remember? Do you? Old enough to be your parents. You know what, Daddy? I don't think so. You're only 15 <laughs> years older than me, although I know you were spunky as a teenager. As a matter of fact, let's start with your teenage days, shall we? You were a hooligan. Still are. Well, uh, yeah, I, did. I was arrested a number of times. Yeah, I've got that to, you know, substantiate my background. And, and arrested for just random juvenile hooligan behavior or, or anything specific? Mm -hmm. Or is, can we ask that? I'm arrested for a lot of things. Okay. I'll, I'll give you an example. Sure. I used to get a lot of speeding tickets on motorcycles. So one day at school during lunch, the police put up a... A, a radar speed trap behind the school. So I spent I spent my lunch out there going down the street catching people and telling them there was a radar trap. So the <laughs> cops realized, well, they're, they're not giving anybody any tickets anymore. So a cop come down to catch me. He says, hey, buddy, come here. And I says, fuck you, mm. and ran to my class. And I got to class. The cops were waiting for me. So they put me in handcuffs and I mean, walked me out in front of the school, and the school cheered when I went oh. to the police car. <laughs> I mean, naughty by nature, I, I, Robert Williams. Yeah, I mean, Damn. you can. I mean, you can technically, by law, tell a cop to fuck off or fuck you, but it's not usually the best of ideas. Well, really. I was interfering with police duty. So. Oh, okay, okay. All, All right, right. Now let's, let's talk about the real crimes here. <laughs> that you won't get. Because, you know, that's the sign of a true criminal. You don't tell anybody what they are. Uh, well, I don't, I don't want to... You know, present myself as a true criminal. I'm I'm a nice guy. You I'm, are. I'm, I'm, hey, most and, most of my favorite criminals are nice yeah, guys. I'm, I'm caring. You know, I'm, I belong to a caring society. You know, I, I have empathy and uh, care for my fellow man. You know. I don't believe one word of that. Actually, I do not believe that is true at all. I think for mm -hmm. most part, you probably abhor most of the human race like I do. Because you know what. Other than the friends and family, and I mean the family you choose, most people do suck. You know, I remember audience well, I, excluded, I, of course. I, I, I was down there by MacArthur Park. You you were uh, you, you were performing down there by MacArthur Park. I forget the name of the venue, that hotel down there. And uh, me and Suzanne and John Pogno went down there, and and, and leaving. We, we, we walked out the door and some, some, we were walking to our car and some young fella come to us with his hands on his face and blood running down his face and he said he'd just been raped. What? That, that's, a, that's a really, really fucking brutal neighborhood down there. You know, it's a... Uh, uh, you I had, no, I had nothing to do with that rape. <clears throat> so, Jeez. you know, we're looking at this poor, poor young square fruit that went to this punk rock thing to see you and he goes steps outside which is this horrible neighborhood this brutal neighborhood and these, these gang members grab him throw him in the car take him off a couple of blocks and screw him in the fanny and then oh dump God. him off you Poor know and he's got be beat up and everything and I I see him coming down the street with blood running down his face and I said hey buddy what happened to you he says I've been raped I've been <laughs> raped and it does I'm, happen to men well, too well well, Hashtag men too. Well, 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 let me get my little marginal story over here. So, anyway, I'm looking around, and here's this little Latino fella that's about 20 paces behind him. And I said, hey, 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 do, do you know anything about this? And he pulls out this little nickel-plated revolver and starts shooting at our feet. Mm -hmm. So we forget the, forget the rape guy. <laughs> <laughs> Murder is the case that they gave me. We, we, we take off to uh, take off to get in the car and then th throw a U-turn and come back. And by this time, the, the guy's walking down Wilshire, still crying and whining. And so I pulled up and I said, buddy, you better get in his car. You know, I'll, I'll drop you back over in front of this venue. So he, he didn't want to go. And he's just really, is, he was really emotionally destroyed. So we took him over there and dropped him off. And, but the, the, the gist of this story was, when, when I told you the next day, this is the first time I ever got any empathy out of you. You, know, this was, <laughs> you were real upset about this. <laughs> you don't remember the story, Lydia? I have no recollection. Wait, what, what year is this again? I only wish the gangbangers 
They picked the wrong victim. Well, if they would have picked me, I wouldn't have been a victim, and probably I would have nickel-plated them to death, just saying. Of course, I don't want a young fan of mine to be molested by outside influences. Well. I mean, they'd already been brain-fucked. Now they were ass-fucked. That's just not right. Well, anyway, I, uh, I thought that'd be a... a, a Good a, introduction a, to your A day in the life at one of your performances, you know? Well, I mean... She is a lightning rod for a lot of interesting scenarios. I admit my own violence. I'm not there to encourage others. I'm actually there to be the salve to the wound that is in their soul that art should try to cauterize. So, I mean, I had no influence over that incident. I'm sorry, the poor man experience what so many of us women have had to face uh, historically forever that is not the effect I want my show to have but then the gangbangers weren't at my should have been at my show maybe they could have blown off a little steam in the right place (laughs) Well, he could have got a, a Me Too membership card. Yeah, well, it would have been uh, hashtag men too. We're not going to go there right now. Actually, Robert, aren't you lucky you have already had like 40 or more, 50 maybe, years of painting behind you before the Me Too movement stepped up? I know you've had a lot of harassment from feminists in the past. I, I, I started painting in oil paints in 57, so I got quite a bunch of time on it. You know. You've so. had a lot of flack from feminists in the past. Why? I, I have, and you, know, you have come to my defense on a number of occasions. I yes. appreciate that. That's, she's, uh, uh, that's, why we're ta- that's why we're talking now. Cheerleader of all perversions. Well, you know, she's been attacked from both sides throughout the decades for just being herself and being. <clears throat> she hasn't changed. <clears throat> well, I, I have a great deal of sympathy for the women's movement, and uh, I, I don't want to get into a thing like that because that's just. Uh, that's going to be a dead end thing where I look bad. And then me too, because when you trust me, maybe I'll give you a little bit of my me too speech after this. We ain't going on record with this, however. I came to your defense, did I? Yeah. Well, because I looked beyond the obvious. I looked a bit deeper into what what you present, and also they never read anything that goes mm. beyond. They don't understand your fetish. Your your fetish is actually elevating women to the status mm. of goddess. All the women in your paintings are the goddesses, whether well, they're clothed mm-hmm. naked or sitting on a taco or not. Well, men make the mistake of uh, considering w- women's freedom and liberation as uh, sexual, too. And uh, that, uh, it seemed like that might be changing now. I, I don't know. So uh, I don't think people really know <clears throat> what they want out of any of this. I mean, it's, it's well, not really clear. <laughs> but, the, but, but people are angry and they want to attack. I mean, that, that, Well, that my theory is, look, I mean, we... we if we want to look at it from the 50s to the 70s to the nihilism, 50s to the 60s, which was supposedly the sexual revolution, and the 70s, which was pretty much the nihilist revolution, and then in the, by the 2000s, with the uprise of porn, the pornification of everything, the onslaught of women used as tools to sell everything, and everything being porno hypergraphic, that then the millennials now are rebelling against that. It makes sense. It's just a cycle that goes on. But I mean, this is Victorian in theme. Oh, yeah. And no. that kind of disturbs me. But however, we are kind of left out of that mix because we've been around long enough so that they don't even know who we are. Well, <laughs> not paying well, attention that, that, to us. That, that's the problem when you're a little older. You, you, you get to see too many things. If you're young, you think, uh, you know, you're recreating the wheel every day. You know, you're inventing the wheel anew every day. Not, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Speaking about <laughs> wheels, your hot rods, you're going to a big hot rod convention this weekend. Yeah. That's right. What hot rods? What, what what cars are you putting in the show now? Well, I, I've got. I'm going to. Me and Suzanne are going over to Pomona for the Grand National Roadster Show. Which See is, my future ex husband, Bobby Walden. <laughs> <laughs> Just thought I'd get that in there. So uh, they've got a, a museum over there, the National Hot Rod Association Museum, and my coop is over there, and then my coop. Ro- uh, my 32 Ford Coupe. And then my 32 Ford Roadster's over at the Peterson Museum at an art show there that I think you ought to go see. It's right near where I'm staying, the Peterson. I'm well, staying in the Mid Wilshire District. You, you should go see this show. Okay, I will. Mm-hmm. It's a juxtapose show. Oh, no, I'm going then. I, I, bet, there's, I bet there's, uh, you know, 90% of the artists I in there. Gary Pan and all of them in this, this show. Did you organize that or did they organize well, it? Well, uh, they came to me. They came, came to the expert. And I got about four pieces in it. There's 50 artists in it. Me, okay. It's right by where I'm oh, standing. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I'll give you a flyer on Thank that. Thank you about that. So anyway, I'm going to, me and Suzanne are going to this hot rod thing. That, uh, the, the, the arts 
in the hot rod world, that they don't mesh very well. See, the cr- the, there's not much crossover. There's not much crossover. There's well, a little crossover. Because the art world is right. fucking up tight. Well, uh, I don't know. You got you, you got cultural problems there. You uh, okay. You've got a, a, a semi-conservative world that uh, it's, it's the hot rod world, and then you've got uh, the art world that's uh, chronically faux liberal. That's uh, really concerned with political correctness. Oh and, yeah, yeah, and the humanities. Yeah, the arts are basically the humanities. You know, uh, have to. Uh, paraphrase what I'm saying. I no, it's it's. I, I, I know what you're saying, and and, and it's, there's a trend now about people judging the art on whether they think the person's a good person or not. Which, of course, our definitions of these things are ever changing too. So this is a uh, seems like a lose lose situation. Well, well, let me cough out my thoughts here. I am uh, part and parcel part of the art world. And I have a number of friends and some very intelligent friends that hate the art world, that, that hate art. And, uh, uh, you know, it's a lot. It's very difficult for some people to accept a, a crucifix in a jar of urine as art or whatnot or, or right. deal with conceptualism or whatnot. I don't think there's such a thing as bad art. I think there's art you're interested in and art you're not interested in. Art, art is subjective. We function in an objective world, and art is a subjective fantasy world, you know. So um, to... to Fuss over rights and wrongs in art is like trying to apprehend a fart in a, an Apache dream catcher. You know? <laughs> um, uh, I am coming to the art world from way out in left field, and I don't mean left field as leftist, but I mean uh, I'm off the wall area. I am coming to the orthodox art world from the comic book world. Yeah, and um, now I, I get criticism for this remark, but uh, there hasn't been any real emphasis on representational art since before the Second World War, and the reason for this is because of the advent of uh, abstract expressionism. In other words, uh, Paris was the capital of the art world yep. up until 1939, and then afterwards New York took over. And New York took over uh, with one form of art specifically, and that was abstract expressionism, and that was uh, by the efforts of Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg. Uh, when abstract expressionists came in, when that movement came in, it just totally dominated the art world for a long, long time. And it, one of its unmentioned prefaces was that um, people that have a need to see three-dimensional three representation are people that are mentally weak, that they don't have the intellectual stability to uh, appreciate two-dimensional presentation. <laughs> they, so this this worked for a long, long time. Now, in the late 50s and early 60s, pop art came in came in out of England, and it was uh, its first name was actually um, neorealism, but the pop art kind of hung on to it. The, the problem of pop art was that pop art totally depended on appropriation of things. So imagination was really uh, impacted. But nonetheless, it made a wonderful form of decorations, much like, like abstract expressionism. Now, I'm a big fan of abstract expressionism. I like de Kooning and a, a, a lot of the abstract expressionists, especially the first generation of abstract expressionists. But I went to art school in the early 60s, me and Suzanne, and... Uh, you had to be an abstract expressionist. Okay. You know? And when I would show tendencies to, to, to draw or represent something, I was immediately called the illustrator. Say. And people would make fun of me because I stood in front of an easel with an arm palette, you know, like a classical painter, and I was silly. Say. So I made it through life still trying to be a representational artist and you know, hoping that, that maybe pop art would develop into something else. It really never did. It just got bigger and bigger and bigger and it's still in a form of appropriation. So I did a series of paintings in the 60s. They were very tight, and I was fortunate enough to find a collector that I could sell them to. But no gallery would show me. No magazine would reproduce them. There's museums wouldn't touch me. I was just like a, an odd bird. So I kept at it. 
So I <laughs> finally got a job with this guy named Ed Big Daddy Roth, a custom yep. car builder, yep. say. And he looked at my portfolio and he says, well, you know, if I knew you were alive, I'd have hunted you up. Right? <laughs> now, <clears throat> let me explain. When I come to California in 63, I tried desperately to stay away from hot rods and motorcycles because I was- Because you got into trouble with them Well, the I was always in trouble and I was taking drugs and I was okay. just- so wait, 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 what drugs were those? Well, this is the 60s. Well, marijuana and a lot of uppers and downers. Psychedelics? And psychedelics. No, psychedelics. psychedelics didn't come in until uh, like uh, 64, 65. But I was on that too. I was on that. I didn't miss that. <laughs> well, your paintings are incredibly psychedelic and no okay. doubt your, 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 your doors have been opened. <laughs> Okay, so I uh, get this job with Ed Big Daddy Roth, and I, I, I really, the last thing I wanted was to get back in the hot rod world. I was trying to straighten myself up to be a gentleman, and I went to the unemployment agency, and they said, well, we don't have anything for you. And they said, well, we got one thing, but when we send people down there, the conditions are dirty and everything. I said, well, what is it? And they go, well, it's an art director for Ed Big Daddy Roth. I said, give me the phone. <laughs> well, I knew Ed from car shows in, the, in 1960. So I went down there, and Ed looked at my portfolio and says, I knew you were alive. You know, I'd have uh, fer ferreted you out, you know. So I, um, all of a sudden, I was making a lot of money. You know, and I was his art director doing ads, and I met uh, Stanley Mouse, a psychedelic poster artist. So anyway, I, you know, I'm, my mind is poisoned with comic book art and B-movie posters and pulp covers and girly magazines, you know, and it just really doesn't look like here's a place for me in the fine arts world, but I keep having this notion, man, if, if I like this really lush art, there's got to be an audience for it. You know? Anyway, I meet um, Mouse and Rick Griffin and uh, the psychedelic poster artists, and through them, I met Gilbert Shelton and then th Robert Crumb, and that yep. got me into Zap Comics. What year was that, that you met Robert Crumb? That was, uh, that was 68, 69. Now, did you meet Robert up in the Bay Area? No, he no. came down here to, with Gilbert Shelton. Gilbert okay. Shelton was staying in Venice in a place called the Couth Club. It was a bunch of decadents on the canals called the Couth Club. Yeah. They get naked. They, they were on the canals. They get naked at night and run to the beach naked, run to the, you know, out in the water naked. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Fun Couth Club. <laughs> I was just like, uh, so you met those two. Yeah. And so, uh, well, I knew Rick Griffin. and uh, So anyway, I uh, got into Zap. Now, uh, I'm, I was like m maybe the f one of the first 10 underground comic book artists. There's already underground editorial artists that were real good, like Ron Cobb and whatnot. So there were some pretty intelligent people in the free press and the um, uh, underground papers in New York and whatnot that were uh, serving a need. So I um, started doing zaps, you know, and I, oh, yeah. man, I just took right to that. Oh, you know, and amazing. I saw, I saw Wilson freedom, stuff. Freedom, uh, freedom, freedom, freedom yes, to create yeah. what you Well, uh, 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 not just freedom, but a responsibility to, to see how far the imagination would go. Right. Absolutely. Not just wiping right. my Peter on the yeah. paper, you now, know. But I have uh, to confess something, because I always say there's a few things that you sh maybe you shouldn't witness before you were age nine my dad had a bunch of zaps and i was like comic books i was four or five and i opened them up i was like what the well, fuck I, i'm gonna interject here with a little tale of my own my two cousins who i was sent to live with before i ran away to new york for good they sold their big daddy ed roth model collection to open they were twins twin comic book stores which mm -hmm. became the biggest comic book stores in upstate new york and actually my, my one cousin it was called empire comics sold the first million dollar comic. Of course, I didn't get any of that money, but so I kind of had already, I mean, I knew the Big Daddy Ed Roth mm -hmm. stuff when I was just a teenager, not even knowing where it was going to lead, for instance, to the birthday party album cover and then eventually to you. Okay. Connective tissue. <clears throat> okay. On. Let me do a sidebar. Sure. I okay. love sidebars. I mean. Okay, I'm a kid. Yep. Living in Alabama for a while. Say. Which city? Montgomery, Alabama. Oh, Montgomery. Yes. Yeah. All right. Okay, I'm just a little kid. Right. And I get into comic books, you know, I'm like eight or nine, and I like pictures, and I've always been an artist. I always attracted to comic books for pictures, and I learned to read the comics and started to understand. And there was one set of comics called Entertainment Comics, EC Comics, that were just fucking exceptionally well-drawn and well-written. You know, Bradbury would write stories and stuff like yeah, this. 
and it was just a, <clears throat> a lot of blood and guts and sexual innuendos. Yep. And, and like I'm a little kid just taking this in, mm-hmm. you know. Yep. So I'm uh, Come along about 1953, 54, there's this guy named Frederick Wortham, Dr. Frederick Wortham. So when all of a sudden, I didn't know about this sub, subcommittee or anything. All of a sudden, no more EC Comics, and there's little happy animal oh shit. And, yeah, yeah. You know, some Disney, con- Disney Comics and stuff. And so the comics got kind of pathetic, and I kind of like, well, I, I don't know what happened here. Maybe. that? <laughs> <laughs> so... Years later, when I when I meet the Zap artist, I find out these are all people that went to art school that had orthodox academic right. backgrounds in the arts, and they all had the same problem. They went to art school and it was all fucking abstract expressionists. So they they were left on, on an island by themselves in the middle of millions of people. So also find out that they all read EC comic books. Oh wow! So Zap was a revenge. Oh, amazing! See? Nice, amazing. See? You see, you think the fucking ECs were terrible? You ain't yeah. seen shit. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. We have pee pee doo doo in these. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. now I have to bear. We all had to bear the responsibility that more than four hundred people went to jail for selling those oh things. my god so, uh, and that was uh, obscenity law yeah. uh, what, trials. Year, what year was that then what, 70, 70, 70, 71. 70. Yeah, that, that's the Hamling versus the uh, right. federal government. Yeah, yes. unbelievable. And, and that we were talking about Hamling the other day. They also, Me, was, Wilson, and Spain were in Crum yeah. were the ones names in court. Oh my fucking god! I'm still naively thinking, why can't I take this to the fucking art world? Now the Vietnam War come out. This was during the Vietnam War. Where was this academic power and graphics to to fight the Vietnam War? Well, they're all abstract expressionists. They couldn't do shit. Exactly. They had, no t- they had no yeah. syntax. They, yeah. had, they had no language. Right, right. You know? Because they're, 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 they're making smears and all kind of stuff, you know, and sloshes and stuff. And uh, so that was, a, that, that, was, that was a sad thing, really. Time goes by. Time goes by. And I'm, I had a bunch of real nice paintings. I sold them to a millionaire. It took care of me for a while. Amen. See? But I still can't get in a gallery. I have no peer group other than the comic book friends, and they're not interested in being painters. So then the punk rock movement comes along, and I'm, I'm friends with Gary Panner and a bunch of these guys, uh, George Ann Dean, a bunch of punk rock artists. And so I realized, you know, they're, they're, they're having these art shows at night in these venues where they're using art shows as an a after-hours cover to sell alcohol without a license. And the artwork is just any kind of shit you can do. So I figure, well, you know... Uh, I know anatomy, and I can paint pretty fast. I can do some real gratuitous sex and violence and make it look hammered out, you know. And uh, so I started a series of paintings called Zombie Mystery Paintings. They were painted on jute, which is burlap, you know. Yep. So the, the more you fuck the painting up, the better it looked, because you go to these after-hour club, and people are going to puke totally. on the painting and stab it. and Beer still, um, yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, I, all of a sudden, I had this giant following overnight. And these Amazing. People were, these people with... Uh, 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 these garage bands were wanting these things for covers. You know, I was there licensing these things right and left to people. And it was just uh, from obscurity to all of a sudden this old man, someone in this young bohemian group. So that, that worked out really good. And uh, here, right under the nose of the academic world, I got a, a, a bunch of other artists that are doing representational art, you know. So now... So punk, punk rock clubs... Saved your life. Now, pardon? Punk rock clubs basically at that point was the jumping off the, the, point for the you. The true bohemian world come to mind. My because age. violence, yeah. sex, drugs were not. Okay. Did not. It wasn't. Were it was, I wasn't like interested in making a piece of artwork that people beat off of, but I was interested to do something that had enormous amount of energy, and nothing has more energy than sex and violence. Right. See? And it, it, it was so, the stuff is like, like, like beating off to a Zap comic is ridiculous. Right. It's so fucking stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it's so energy charged. Yeah. Right? And I took that language, that vocabulary, to these paintings. Yep. See? Now, the orthodox art world sees this stuff and shit their pants. This was horrifying. Right. It had 
women nude and all kind of <clears> stuff, <throat> and it just uh, the feminist movement really started straining on me. I wish because um, they misread they misread everything because well, they, they didn't even look deep <clears throat> enough. As I was saying before, they did not look yeah. deep enough to understand they, your they, elevation of the female form to Amazonian <clears throat> goddess. Well, I, I I was the target that they needed. They needed a, a real tangible target, and I fit the bill. <clears throat> so uh, after a while, not only this stuff ended up on album covers, but it started getting in tattoo magazines and car magazines and a whole bunch of this uh, secondary cultural publications. So then I, I was talking to a gal that put out the tattoo magazine, and I said, you know, um, she was doing an article on me, a second or third article on me. And I said, you know, they're... they're we need a magazine just of this kind of art. We need, uh, you know, like like the the surrealist had um, uh, Minotaur and the uh, psychedelic the, um, um, uh, surrealist revolution magazines uh, in the 30s, 20s and 30s. We need a magazine like that now, just this work. And I, I thought, well, this is a tattoo girl. This is just going to go in one hole and out the other. And she called back two weeks and says, well, I talked to my publisher. We could do this magazine. Yeah. Wow. So they did the magazine, and I, I was like the the content. To it to get people in it, and the name of the magazine was um, Art Alternatives. Well, it was doing really, really good, but then they fired the girl, so oh. I had no connection oh, to the. No. I had no connection to the magazine anymore. So they just started. They say, the publisher saw, well, I, we can just do any kind of goofy shit and it'll sell, and then the magazine took it down. All right. Me and Suzanne and Greg Escalani and, and uh, Craig Stesick, we all got together and thought, well, you know, maybe we ought to find someone to buy that title and revive that thing, you Ooh. know. So uh, we got a hold of um, Fausto Vitella at Thrasher. I had a bunch of okay. covers on Thrasher. Wow. And uh, so the, he said he was real interested in buying that title. So um, um, uh, we got in touch with the, the publisher. The publisher said, I don't want to sell it. So I said, well, you know, we'll just do our own one. There so I, I submitted a, a list of 125 names, and they picked Juxtapose. So. Nice. So then I flew up to, to uh, San Francisco to, to Thrasher and had a business meeting and told them, you know, I was the founder, told them exactly how I wanted the son of a bitch. The first <laughs> magazine I just played off at the side, I realized, well, I better get a hold of the fucking thing this time. Right. See? So Juxtapose started out, the first issue was quarterly. It started off at 23000 What year was that, Robert? 94. 94. So it sold really, really well, paid for itself. And then it, every issue, it sold better and better and better. And the thing about it was, it was the real anomaly was it had one of the highest sell-throughs of any magazine on the stands. In other words, a sell-through is like if you print... 10,000 magazines, uh, uh, 6,000 are going to be th- scrapped. Right. If you sell 4,000, yeah. You know, yeah, see, so, but this thing had this incredible sell through that these, you know, and the, 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 the mafia and everyone that deals in these news <laughs> distributors, they have never seen anything like this. Right. See, so it started really being supported. And then it went uh, bigger. It went from uh, quarterly to bi-monthly to monthly. And then it went... um then it then it surpasses the sales of uh, uh, Art Forum. Uh, well, well is, and it has no competition. The beauty is it has no competition. Art Forum is not as competition because that's all so-called highbrow bullshit. Some articles no. are good. It had no yeah, competition. Yeah. You created it and then you yeah, endorsed. You didn't die and then you reading those magazines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so, so then it outsold. Then it outsold um, Art in America. Now was uh, quite an accomplishment. Then finally, after a year or two, it outsold a big one is art news so then this shitty little publication become top selling art magazine on planet earth so. as it deserved to be wow so anyway congratulations yeah. anyway i had this i was in this position of having uh, the power to get into galleries and museums and you know yep. say well we have these artists that do this sort of thing <laughs> but as it got bigger and bigger and more powerful and more people got in on everything dilutes out now let me explain to this when zap comics come out it, some of those issues sold over a million and Holy people shit. Not, but then but then as zap got bigger there started being more and more and more underground comics and more right. and more the people that come into it are johnny come lately they want to show this to their aunt and uncle right and tone and watering it down and this just killed it, it erodes so, it. well the same thing was happening here shit. the same thing i found out later this is the same thing it happened to minotaur and the third 
30s. It started out with Picasso and Dolly and Marguerite, and then it ends up it ends up to a fucking fashion magazine. See, right? So these things, so the, the, the juxtapose started getting bigger and bigger and more powerful, but then it had to take in a lot more quiet material. So my position got tentative, you know. Right. I, I couldn't fight it any longer. Started getting it into big-eyed children and tiki's and, <laughs> and innocent oh, shit. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? So m- my outlaw position just kind of was like a novelty put off to the side. You know, it was kind of like a, a situation that was no longer uh, yep. uh, 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 valid or vital. Um, well, I've been asking a question f- for a while about why do certain genres, uh, I'm, I'm more in the music world, why is the trajectory the way it is where it starts out as this incredible thing and then it ends up, you know, they're telling you the, the, the weather report for the next uh, week and it's the music in the background. And, and, it, and it's like that's such a, such a great explanation, just the erosion and all, and all the uh, basically the hijackers. And the are, homogenization. Well, everything runs its course. I mean, everything is cyclical. It has to run its course. So you start with this ideal, which is the ideal of what it should be. You promote that. You inhabit it. You promote that and put it out. And eventually it's just going to run its course when it's then homogenized and made. Not, it's not mainstream, but more people come to it. So it's going to become diluted. So did you yeah. jump out well, and juxtapose? It, 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 it's the natural situation, like you said, all, all zeitgeist uh, burns out. Yeah. You know, there's, people aren't there for its substance, they're there for the zeitgeist. Right. You know? and so, the, I don't know if you've ever heard this name, Walter Hopps. You have not. You, well, have you? Have you? I, 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 I'm ahead, not familiar. Go, no. Carry on. Educate oh, okay. me. I'm here for an education. You, uh, this, this is sad that you have never heard the name so Walter I'm Hobbs. Real re- cause, hey, cause I can only hear so many things. He one of the most important well, people. I'm, I'm, not in, I'm not in the art world. Yeah. You are. Okay. <laughs> I'm out of the art world. You know, I'm not the, even in the music world. Okay. You've heard, ever heard of Ferris Gallery? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. Walter Hopps started Ferris Gallery. God, Approximately. 63, 64. All right. Carry on. Okay. I was four years old. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. Now I'm I'm struggling in LA, you know, trying trying to get somewhere, licking asses, do whatever I can just to become a, a you know a, a known artist to make a living in the fine arts world. <clears throat> I keep running into different well-known artists like Ed Ruscha and Billy Al Bankston and Ed Moses and these people, and yeah. Robert Irwin, all these people, all these people owe everything they've got to to Walter Hopps. Walter Hopps. Walter Hopps was the guy that got Andy Warhol his first show. <laughs> Andy w- Walter Hopps was the first guy to bring Marcel Duchamp over here since 1913. And when you see him play, you see that picture of um, Walter Hopps with uh, Duchamp and, and that girl in the nude. That's Eva Babbitt's. You know, that, yeah, yeah, that's one of Ed Ruscha's old girlfriends. So it's, all the circle starts working around Walter Hopps. He was, he was in charge. Of the, he was a director in, uh, of the Pasadena Museum until they threw him out for drug problems. Walter Hopps was the guy that had the first Zap show in, in 1971 at the Corcoran Museum in Washington D.C. Oh, can you you see where um, this guy's yes. head's at? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well. Above everybody uh, else's. I, I, I have a lot of trouble with high-ranking academics, and I've come to be very pessimistic about him. And then I run across Walter Hopps, and uh, you know I didn't treat him very respectfully. But then you know I had, uh, I got to talking to him, got to know him. Then I realized how powerful he was. He was enormously powerful. He, he was one of the most important people on planet Earth for art. Well, before he died, he was designated in Europe as the world's number one museum uh, director and curator. See. It, uh, he told me so much insight about the art world, the private art world. It's like I, I, I didn't get very far up the ladder, but all of a sudden I'm talking to the persons at the very top is my buddy. And I, 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 I asked him, you said, I told him, I said, you know, I, I was doing good. Come out here to be an artist. And then that abstract expressionist shit come along and it murdered me. He says, I brought it. I said, do you, <laughs> do, do, you know how, do, do you know how that fucked me up? Oh. You know, I explained, that really fucked me up. That, hope he had guilt. <laughs> And then, then, you know, I, I was talking to him, and, you know, I says, you know, I go in these museums and these galleries, and all they hang all the paintings up at 58-inch centers. Well, where'd that bullshit come from? He says, I came up with that. And I said, well, that's great, but what if you got a painting with a low horizon on it? He says, you know, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, having uh, him as a very, very close friend, you know, and uh, I still, me and Suzanne still see his widow, and he was just so important at 
that, well, he's the one that got me the gallery, Tony Schifrazi in New York. You know, he was just a, a, an operator and a wonderful, wonderful person. And I just uh, regained my faith in this, this very pathetic world, you know. But uh, there's a book on the market now called the, the Dream Colony. It's a story of Walter Hobbs, you know, and... Uh, uh, to, to, to be at the lowest phylum of the arts and have access to this character yeah, amazing. was remarkable. And he knew exactly what my worth was. He understood juxtapose. He wanted to write for juxtapose. You know, it's just, mm. He wrote, <clears throat> I, would, I had a book come out in 97, and the publisher says, we, we need somebody real important to uh, write the introduction. And I said, well, I, I, I don't know who that would be. And they said, well, what if we go to, to Robert Hughes? And I go, well, mm. I, I don't know about that because I don't think he likes my work. And they said, <laughs> well, what? He was in the Crumb documentary. Why don't we just call him, send him a letter? And I said, well, you send him a letter, but you bear the embarrassment from the rejection. Say, I don't want to hear about this. So they, they sent him a letter, and I thought it would be a couple of weeks. We got The next day he replied, he said he didn't want his name associated with Robert Williams. Wow. So I called up Walter. I said, Walter, I'm in a position here. I got to get someone real important for this this uh, book. You know, he says, well, I, I, I'll, I'll do an introduction for you. He did a seven-page essay. I talked to Ed Ruscha. Ruscha said, i never seen him ever do that for anybody ever. Say, you know. Amazing. I'm, it, it, being the bottom of the barrel, I can still see a lot of light. So, did you ever did you ever see a Tondone Marcel Duchamp's piece at the Philadelphia Museum? No, I, I didn't. I have to say, I did. And no. I have to say, what's so amazing about this is, first of all, there's a barn door. There's two peepholes. People just walk past it. You go to those peepholes. And see and the lady, yeah. Well, and you don't see the face. So what you see is this bad watercolor in the background, like trickling silver and shit. Mm. On the foreground, that is the ground, is hay. Lantern tipped on its side. Naked woman, vulva, naked, ex exposed, head tilted, and River's Edge, the film, actually copied this image, I think, for their death scene of this. And so once, this is one of my favorite pieces of art in the world, because he said he was playing chess for 20 years. He was getting that pigskin right on that body of that woman. So I'm talking to somebody I lived with who was a graffiti artist, and he said, I know what the face looked like. I said, you do not tell me what that face looked like, because you will blow my entire fantasy of that. Well, Robert, I wrote an introduction for one of your books, and I'm sorry I wasn't like, I was your buddy. I was your buddy. How did that come about? How did you? How did I get you to do that? No. Well, I don't know. How do we even meet? Yeah, that's what I. Uh, Let's go back to. I'll, I'll tell you exactly how we met. Was uh, no Jim Farewell called me up to do, use a piece of my art uh, for a stink fest? And then, yeah, and you got on the phone. I did what I say. Uh, I, I don't remember. Maybe you said Jim wasn't here right now or something. No, right. that was before we had cell phones. Anyway. Well, what year was this, would you say? That was 86. 86, how, okay. How does he fucking remember this? <laughs> that was for my record, Stink Fist, which had seven drummers. It was just a sexual well, Stink Fist came a lot later. Stink Fist came a lot later. So what was it for then? Uh, oh, no, it might have been, yeah, because there was something else. Yeah. It actually might have been for one of Thurwell's other projects. Yeah. yeah it was. Yeah, I saw Jim here about two months ago. He's doing fine. Yeah. So yeah. I get on the phone. So then what? However, what about how do we meet? You were coming to town, and you and Jim were coming to town, and you were playing at this place I can't remember the name of, and... Uh, they said uh, it was in the L.A. Free Press. They looked up your dress and saw your coups. And, uh, that was enough to get you to the show. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> you came to see my coups? No, I come because I was friends with Jim. Oh, God, so, it had nothing to do with me. You, you had no idea what I was about. Yes, I did. How did you? No, I Why? Knew all, I knew a little all about what you. What did you mean you knew about me? I, because I was running in uh, punk rock circles. I'm not punk rock. I'm no wave. You're no wave? I'm no wave. Yeah. Well, whatever you were, your whatever name was you thought I was around Hollywood All right. a lot. All right, fine. So we meet. Yeah. What and happens? I, 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 you know, I've, I've seen young girls dressed just like you trying to be. Yeah, they well, still that's do. been going on, and I can't help that I invented that look back in 73 when it was glam, not goth, but I was mm -hmm. goth before there was goth, yeah. not physical though. So, however, well, Brian, we meet. Brian Coley said he had some real good pictures of you as a real little girl dressed to go to a Kiss concert. Oh, he's and told I, me about that. I'm those dying to see too. those pictures because I throw that shit up to you so fast. I'll embarrass you at both. You 
Yeah, yeah, you know what? You won't embarrass me because you know how good I looked at 14. Actually, I look better now than I did at 14. I look like a serial killer. I had cherry black hair, slick back, no eyebrows, black eyeshadow, wet look dress. That's me at 13. That's 73. Now, you want to see pictures hey, I, that I got one? I, I don't want to cramp your style, but I thought this was about me. Yeah, well, right. <laughs> yeah, you haven't talked enough about yourself. I want to know how we met. <laughs> Because as you said before, well, I defended I you, you. I told you. I, 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 you read about my coups in the L.A. Free Press. No, no, no. I met you before that. <laughs> All right. I, I met, anyway. I, I met you before that. But I think the earliest time I remember is when I went to that concert, and then the re, the review on that was that they could look up your... Uh, oh, well, oh, isn't wow. that what it's all about? Like, my puss hasn't been exposed enough in the films I made, and if you want to see it, honey, it's right here. You know, Biggie. Now... My goodness. How'd I come to write Christ, that intro yeah, for you? My, my How'd I come? Little seeds have climbed up in my oh, stomach. Don't get oh a gosh, hard on and cr- hide it from me. If you got God. a hard on, just put it on the bar so oh. I can see it at least. Jesus Christ. <laughs> really? I know you still get it up when I'm around. You had a hot cupcake over there. You are surrounded by two goddesses. Don't tell me you're not stiff. And if you're not, we can work on that later. Just saying. Yeah. How did I come no, to write I, that? I, I might have to step out of the room and pull myself together. Yeah, I mean, oh, you might boy. have to pull yourself off. Go ahead if you must, Daddy. How did I call? to write that intro for you. I have to say, that is one of my best... I was looking for that article because I don't know how to copy the book here. It is one of my best pieces of writing. Well, okay. It, um, yeah, it was, in, it was in a book called uh, um, Visual Addiction. Visual Addiction. Well, I was very honored that you asked me to write it. Yeah, well, you did a good job, you know. And that, I, that I have to a, find that article. I'm going to buy a copy. I think it sold out just so I can remember what I wrote. Anyway, <laughs> I'm going to tell um, something about what you gave me. The clap? You, no, oh, no, honey, no, you never. The punchlines. Okay. I would have given you a slap if you gave me the clap, and you never gave me the clap, so no, therefore okay. your let's, cheeks are only red because you're blushing because I love you. <laughs> now, you gave me a title <laughs> called Psycho Menstrum. Oh, yeah. And well, so, you want me to do a, f- a film with you, and that's where all that came from. You ca- gave me a title called Psycho Manistrum. So I wrote a script, which was basically about a Dr. Jekyll's sister Hyde, a woman who was trying to find, by via experimental application of outrageous drugs, the cure for the monthly monster and feminine cancer. And she's shooting hor- hormones, progesterone, estrogen, and becomes kind of a, a killer. Fucks and kills like a man. So we wrote this script, or I wrote this script, and we tried to shove it around. It didn't go anywhere. I made three, three uh, story proposals. Um, I wrote the you. script, didn't go anywhere. Well, uh, still that time. happens. Still that time. Happens. Hey, tell me about it. 80% of this stuff in Hollywood However, failed. it was a great experience, and you did give me the title. One of the, one of the uh, stories was about a young punk rock girl in Italy that's family was... In, involved in the fascist and futurist movements, and she carried on this tradition. Talking about me again? Yeah. <laughs> and then the other one, the other I one was about that. a cult that you belong to that would cultivate dorks and find the dorkiest people <laughs> and take like them out to this and and get, down dink. and play like you are a dork too and get them to dork <laughs> get them to dork as much as you could. That had to go right out the fucking window it came and, in. And another one was I was trying to seriously get you to do um, uh, Pacini's uh, Girl of the Golden West but you'd be the lesbian heavy. I remember none of this. <laughs> and as a, as, and as, as, as a as considering myself as a do a faggot tr- truck driver, it's not a far call to be a lesbian heavy. It's just the other side of the coin. <clears throat> uh, this is the Lydian Spin with Tim Dahl. We're talking to Robert Williams, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite writers. Forget, the paintings are amazing. The writing. Tell me about the writing, Robert. Why does nobody ever talk to you? I mean, <clears throat> the, the, write, the paragraphs that for these paintings, to me, are just, they are a, they are a, a psychic <clears throat> orgasm. Well, uh, I, I I have to defend the pictures, so I, I no, no, do the yeah, we, we know how the we know you know what everybody looks at the pictures because you go online to look at your images, they're all there. Why isn't the writing there to accompany the the, the pictures? Well, uh, don't undercut I, I, yourself. You're a genius writer, my friend. Oh, uh, 
<laughs> well, listen, I want you to I want you to try to spread my legend, you know. So, uh, you know, if I could spread my legs in order to help you spread <laughs> your legend, I'd do that for you. But I got no truck between my legs. Ain't gonna help. But go you ahead. Know, uh, spreading my legends like trying to st- to stretch a prophylactic over the mouth of a mason jar. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. That's the kind of writing he does. So he may whatever whatever term he wants to use for his paintings. I can't even term his writing because it's so brilliantly psychedelic. Jeez. And far yeah. out. I mean, I have to say, I want a book. I just want a whole book of all the connective writings just strung together. That's it. Be the best poetry I've ever read. And I'm done, not just blowing. If you, if you don't just, slow down, I'm going to go in the bathroom and look at my driver's license. No, picture. I'm coming oh. with you. I'm coming with you, and then you'll only last about two seconds, and there it'll all be over. Come back and talk some more. Oh. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to have a cigarette break because I feel like I already. I, mean, I feel like we've already done some brain fucking here. Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to caution myself not to say a bunch of stuff that I wished I hadn't said. See, I I'm, doubt. I'm, 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 I think you're saying. I'm putting the, I'm got my, the binders. You know, we'll let the cork really out, the baby. Pull, put the pull the cork out. <laughs> See now, I, well, this is, okay. This is this is what I love about Robert Williams. I actually can make him chuckle, go silent, and almost blush. Me, because you know why? You know I know why you like me, Robert. And don't 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 be shy to admit the faggot in you likes the faggot in me. Because I'm a dirty old man too. And you know what? You're one of the only dirty old men that recognize my dirty old man, Hubert Selby. For, <laughs> Hubert Selby, Nick Chaucer. They see me, they think I'm like 20 years old, some like. No cool chick. They have no idea. Hey, excuse me. I'm dirtier than you are, old man. I think for some reason, somehow, you did recognize that in me. Now it well, might be I'll the t- faggot in you that likes the faggot I, in me. I'm I not sure. I support the gay movement, but you ain't gonna find any of that in me. Okay? Hell, I didn't say I was gay. I said I was a faggot. I don't like being around men. I just don't excuse like me. to touch men. You know what? You think these are tits, right? Best you've ever seen, probably. But these are balls that have ascended. Now, baby, you ain't nothing wrong with that. You see how I'm sitting? I'm manspreading. I mean, I know, I know, I know, I know, I'm not going to say anything more. You got your legs crossed tightly because, you know, you're afraid I might get down there and do what I do best, which is only titillate. Well, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get this conversation on a little higher level. As, you know, instead of <laughs> oh, dude. I thought we were low, bro. Now we're trying to go high, bro. Shit. I'm in the wrong conversation here. I do love you, Robert Williams. You know what? I love your wife, too. And, you know, if you were into polygamy, well, I'd move in and I'd be swimming naked every day. And I'd just put that in your little nugget and think about that. I need a cigarette because that's how excited I am to be in the presence of Suzanne Williams and Robert Williams. This is the Lydian Spin with Tim Dahl. And Robert Williams is going to give us a rare treat of reading some of his fantastic writing. Thank you, Robert. With respect to the historic tradition of art educators, critics, and museum management functionaries, many art cognoscenti have exceeded the fame and notoriety of legendary artists themselves. Literary figures such as John Raskin, Oscar Wilde, Clement Greenberg, Harold Rosenberg, William Wilson, and Robert Hughes have risen to heroic status, and this without dirtying their hands with brush or chisel. Nonetheless, their scholarly machinations are justified. This becomes more obvious as scholastic acceptance of Dada continues, and certainly more recently with the creation of conceptual art theory. Conceptualism allows the unheralded theorist to simply become the honored art conceptualist, thus freeing the artist from the nuisance of hands-on art drudgery. Creative genius knows no bounds. However, there is one higher accolade above theoretic art brilliance. Not not only is this master hypothesizer the artist, he has inadvertently become the art. And being in being such, he he opened up the vulnerability for being himself rejected. That was Robert Williams on the Lydian Spin. I wrote this introduction kindly. Robert Williams asked me to for his book, 
visual addiction, which I think is sold out, but you can probably find expensive copies somewhere on the uh, interweb. Dolly's dead. So is democracy. Suffering under the rule book, burning, Bible thumping, sexual neurotics, we need, and always have and always will, Robert Williams, now as much as ever, like a salve to the sore. One of the few men with big enough balls to spit in the censor's eye, lubricating and fertilizing the salvation so desperately needed in these times of government-enforced drought, where the individual is ignored or eliminated in favor of a mass consensus constructed to serve the few. Those who have amassed enough cash to buy or bully their way into a falsified state of financial freedom. Funny. I thought that freedom and liberty meant having the right to choose. But what's left of choice if they've already censored everything before you can even decide whether or not you want to indulge or buy it? Whatever happened to the individual's inherent right to assimilate information in order to arrive at their own conclusions? That's what kills me about all this bogus feminist misinformation. They, like all the men who have come before them, don't want real liberation, just another form of censorship. More rules, more regulations, more bullshit, a stifling and asphyxiating climate of confusion and doublespeak, hypocrisy, bull-fucking shit. The time is now, as it always is for me. And Robert Williams stubbornly plays Antichrist to all the Holy Marys. Questioning every taboo known to mortal imagination, he conjures up reflections into the bottomless shit pit of human anxiety. We're analyzed down to the most minute detail and refracted back into mega proportion. We are forced to question our own preconceptions, fascinations with frustration, obsession, terror, bloodlust, and death. Pile driving the cranium into a Frankensteinian free-for-all. The rodeo mind races forward, trying desperately to decipher the hidden messages and decode the secrets of these psychointuitive hypercarnalities. <laughs> Straddling the outer limits somewhere between brilliant irony, sheer vulgarity, and complete insanity, his paintings overstimulate the libido, which in turn rages under the cataclysmic motherhood of sensory contradictions. Redefining the natural superiority of women, and oh yes he does, whose mere existence catapults our hero, the artist, into spasmodic and glorious confusions where those lingering preoccupations force us to understand that the price tag of all momentary perfection is always complete and imminent ruination. It is to this end that I applaud this presentation, that I applaud Robert Williams' visual addiction, all of his books and all of his paintings, which splurge into a dangerous and multi-metaphorical sexual nervosa, free from all social, moral, and intellectual inhibitions or obligations. It is only when the individual completely divorces themselves from the rigors and regulations meant as psychological restrictions that true art can be born. And with that in mind, I urge you to indulge completely and thoroughly in the work of Robert Williams. You're listening to The Lydian Spin with Tim Dahl. Thank you very much. (laughs) 